from beautiful downtown Sacramento, it's time for Beach Blanket Fort Bingo! Beach Blanket Fort Bingo! Beach Blanket Fort Bingo! Welcome to Beach Blanket Fort Bingo. I'm your host, Steve Schnee, and we've got another great show for you. Before I introduce today's special guest, I'd like to introduce my co-host. Some know him as the Punk Rock Museum's finest tour guide. In some circles, he's known as the Clark Gable of indie rock, the carnal colonel of the Kiss Army, and a man with a vow to rid the world of the dreaded mullet. However, most of us... (laughs) Most of us know him as a lovable teddy bear, a bass playing monster, and a kick ass co host. Ladies and gentlemen, Ronnie Barnett. Oh, thanks, Steve. That's a lot. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, our special guest today is a British indie rock legend with a career. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, 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 that's not supposed to be funny, David. <laughs> <laughs> with, with a career dating back 40 years, guitarist, songwriter, producer David Newton has been involved with some amazing projects over the years, including co founding alt rock heroes, The Mighty Lemon Drops in 1985. As a songwriter and guitarist for the band, he led the quartet through five albums and a load of singles before they finally split in 1992. Since then, he's moved to the U.S. and spent three decades producing and writing for various projects, including his own, David Newton and the Mighty Angels. We're so lucky to have him with us on this episode, and I'd like you to put your hands together for Mr. David Newton. Welcome to the Blanket Fort, David. Thank you. Hey, (laughs) lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Now, of course... You know, I think being... we can go home, David, after those intros. I yeah. Think oh, no, yeah, we can't. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, you know, before we talk about your most recent projects, let's kind of go back maybe to the beginning. Do you okay. remember do you remember the exact moment when you decided you wanted to become a musician? Was it a single Eureka moment or a series of events? Um, it's funny really, because I mean, I was born in 1964 and uh I kind of grew up, there was always kind of music around the house and all that. And uh, I had an elder sister who was, um, she was more into like kind of top 40 stuff. And, you know, uh, by the time I started buying records was, um, I think the first first thing I ever bought was T-Rex Solid Gold Easy Action, which I think I bought with money I'd got given for Christmas in, I mean, 1972, so 1973. I was fairly young. I was like, what would I have been then? Like about eight years old. That's when I started buying buying records of my own and and it was kind of nice growing up in England because we had a, a nice cross section of um it's funny because much maligned was like you know BBC Radio One and stuff but we did have a really diverse selection of what was like in the charts and what was you know everything from like general pop music to like to, you know and but you'd also get like like you know reggae and we get a lot of American stuff we get a lot, a lot of soul from America then of course we got the glam rock thing we got the you know Gary Glitter and Sweet and Mud which was what I was that was my main thing when I was a preteen that's what I was into you know and uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and then and it was around that time that I think there was a I got get one of my aunts or, get, or uncles gave us a guitar and it was around the house and I couldn't really play it but um, I just used to mess about with it and never thought that I could play you know and of course prog rock had reared its ugly head by then and I'd hear <laughs> like my you know my mates older brothers Yes and Genesis records and think that bloody hell I can never play like that you know mm-hmm. and uh, but. I mean, I know it. You know, it may sound like a cliche to say, but it really, it really. I mean, punk just like blew me sideways. It was like even before punk, I was into like bands like 
Eddie and the Hot Rods and Dr. Feelgood mm-hmm. and all that. And, but I think my, my kind of my almost like Eureka moment was seeing the adverts on top of the pops doing Gary Gilmore's eyes. And it's like, I realized that I, I could actually kind of, I could like play that. Like yeah. even with my kind of basic rudimentary kind of skills of guitar playing. And that's what inspired me to like, you know, and it, I mean, it really was punk. And I mean, I know everybody says that. But uh, but it was. I mean, and and then and of course my 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 life changed. I was like twelve, thirteen years old by then, nineteen seventy seven, and uh, we were really lucky being in the UK because you know punk was you know all, a lot. I mean, a lot of the bands were on top of the pops. Buzzcocks, Clash. Actually, no, the Clash. The Clash would not do top of the pops. <laughs> But um, uh, yeah, but it, it was it was such a fantastic time to be of that age and be a teenager, and that's what inspired me. And I was in punk bands in secondary school with my friends and stuff with some awful names. Which uh, I mean, <laughs> I've, please, yes, please. <laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> our, first band was called, our first punk band was called the Lowest Class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then, we changed our name, then we changed our name to Urban Kids, which was after a song by Chelsea. And then, yeah. then, then this is my, my most embarrassing punk. Man. We were in a band called Gang Warfare, which is like I mean, we were the most like polite, <laughs> like meek. Band, and, uh, we had a female singer as well, so I don't know where the name Gang Warfare came from. But, uh, <laughs> and that was then I left school in 1980, and then it was it was all about kind of. You know the post-punk kind of bands. I was really into like Gang of Four and you know Bunny Man and and uh, Teardrop Explodes, all that kind of stuff. The Au Pairs, and that's that's when I started playing in you know early bands of what became you know uh, you know what the Mighty Eleven Dots became really because we were all you know we all kind of knew we we all kind of got to know each other really well around by a, a, a kind of gig going age really, which was you know um, I would see. We were quite lucky because in Wolverhampton, we had the Wolverhampton Civic Hall, which all the bigger bands would play, and you could get in there. It was all ages, so I could. I think my my first show there was The Clash, The Slits, and uh, in December '78. And uh, but I mean, wow. it was great. Everybody played there. The you know, we've got the Undertones. Um, uh, oh, I mean, I lost count of the, the amount of bands yeah. that were there. Yeah, so it was yeah. great. It was brilliant. <laughs> But then, and then when I was a, a bit older, I could get into clubs because I, I, you know, being the age that I was, because for instance, the Sex Pistols played in Wolverhampton like twice, three times, but it was 18 and over clubs and I was like 13, 12 years old. So I couldn't get in to see those shows, but I was quite lucky. So while I did miss a lot of the smaller bands, I did see, you know, by the, by 79, 80, I was able to see pretty much everybody that came through, which was really nice. It was great. Now, in 1982, you were in a band with Paul Marsh and Tony Linehan named Active Restraints. (laughs) (laughs) But but then you left to form uh, a new band called the Wad Flowers. Now, was Active Active Restraints your first really serious band or, uh, you know, and and why did you abandon that project so early? Kind of. I mean, we were uh, semi-serious. I mean, we weren't that serious. I think I was 17 when they got together. Mm. And uh, we did make a single. We made a seven-inch. There was a local guy that owned it. It was, it was really early on, the video rental kind of boom. And uh, he made so much money that he did. And he was, he was an old Northern Soul DJ called Pep. And he just wanted to start a record label. And uh, he put out our, our first An Active Strange single in 1982. Which uh, it's kind of quite collectible now. It's getting the values inching up a little bit, mm. and, um, and we did that. That was that was me, and because I went to secondary school with Paul, so I'd known him since I was about twelve, and uh, and I'd met Tony, and later Keith, who was also the drummer in the Lemon Dots. Uh, there was a club in Dudley called JB's, and it's like it's it was like it's like two hundred and seventy five capacity. And, Everybody went through there, you know, like my first gig there was the Modettes in oh, wow. 1980. I was like 15 years ah. old I needed to lag my, uh, my way in some, <laughs> somehow. And um, so that's how I met Tony and Keith. So we all kind of knew each other. But uh, 
So then, then when that band we all kind of, we'd, we'd all got uh, regular day jobs by then, and uh, I, I was actually I did a year and a half as an apprentice carpenter, and I actually I actually got fired from my my first job because of showing lack lack of interest because I was more. <laughs> I know pop music and that nonsense. <laughs> That's another great band name, David. Act of the Strings. Like seriously, you, I, I, you, yeah. But I think that was a mate. So there was a, a guy that I knew came up with that. He came up with a name because we didn't have a name, and I was like, "Oh, that's really good." But uh, thank you. But Ronnie, we have another good name coming up in just a moment here. But you recorded one <laughs> album with the Wildflowers. That is correct. Yeah. But then you left. To go back with your friends, uh, uh, Paul and Tony, yeah. and you form the Mighty Lemon Drops. Yeah. Uh, did your time in the Wildflowers did that help you figure out what you wanted to do and not to do in the Mighty Lemon Drops? That's interesting. It did really because we were all friends. Like I'd known well Neil and Dave. I'd known from me from before the band, and um, uh, I don't know really. It was like because we, um, I was still quite young. And uh, we 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 did two singles and an album, and it, it's really funny. We 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 had a manager, and we 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 actually did some dates with Simple Minds on went on their. Mm. I think it was Sparkle in the Rain too, which was like kind wow. of bizarre, you know. I know. <laughs> and um, and that was just literally we would just show up and pump out. We had no roadies or anything, and uh, do that. But um, I don't know. Like towards the end, it was like I just because uh, it was. Active Restraint was kind of I wrote most of the songs and with the Wildflowers, it was like it was a, a kind of group effort and and I kind of wanted to do something where I was kind of more involved in you know in in you know because the the way I, I I would kind of write songs I pretty much come up with the whole thing in my head and just kind of do it from there whereas the Wildflowers was more of a somebody would have an idea and we'd all kind of throw our bits in which is which is great which is another way of doing it but. I think, I mean, there was no big, I can't really think of why, why I ended up um, doing that. But but um, I was unemployed by then and uh, I was knocking about with Paul, Paul Marsh. And uh, that was just, you know, after I decided to leave the Wildflowers, we just, it was about a month, it was like a month or two went by, not even that. And we decided to form a band again. So I got back in touch with Tony. And Tony had got the name The Mighty Lemon Drops. That was, he'd already, the, the band came with that name before we'd even formed. And, but, uh, um, but didn't didn't the band uh, form originally under the name The Sherbet Monsters? Right. That was, a, that was actually a joke. That was another, <laughs> another one of Tony's crazy ideas. Um, and we would like do things under that kind of name, like as a, uh, like when we do like secret kind of low key gigs and that, and I think we made the mistake of telling somebody in one of our press, like um, when I think I know later on when our record company was putting a press release together, when we'd actually got a record company, I think we just said that off the fly just for fun, and it kind of has been carrying us around for forty years. But we weren't, no, we weren't actually originally called that. But all. do you sometimes wish that maybe you kept that name, or do you think that maybe <laughs> maybe your career would be yeah. different? By now, maybe, maybe you know, <laughs> you know what bands I guess you could say contemporaries influenced the direction of the Mighty Lemon Drops. Um, you know, it's funny really because in, in 1985 it was kind of a middle period where you know a lot of the post punk bands that we were listening to had all kind of gone around quiet, like, like Teardrop Explodes had split up. Uh, you know, um, bands like Gang of Four, they kind of taken a different direction. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that kind of, I don't know if you remember that period when they kind of went a bit more yeah. top 40 kind of sound. Yeah. I love a man in a uniform, stuff like it, that. It, that. Which is great. But yeah. Like looking yeah. back now, but when, when you're like 19, 20 years old, you think that you're like, oh, I kind of prefer them a bit when they had louder guitars and that. Yeah. And, um, so we kind of, I don't know, we wanted to take a bit of an element to that. A lot of like kind of 60s garage stuff we were listening to at the time, like the Pebbles and the Nuggets albums compilations mm -hmm. had um, just appeared in the UK at least anyway. I know they were like an American thing. And uh, so we, we were like kind of going back and listening to like, you know, 13th Elevators, The Doors even, and, uh, you know, stuff like that. The Birds as well mm -hmm. were an influence. So we kind of wanted to combine that with, a kind of the the kind of punky energy and um like kind of my uh 
I don't know, I'm not going to say not role models, but as a, I kind of wanted a really kind of abrasive guitar sound. And I really liked the, um, I, I always liked Andy Gill from Gang of Four and also mm -hmm. uh, Wilco Johnson. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pilgrim was a big influence. Mm -hmm. And uh, even like early War Heat, Pete Wiley's guitar sound on those early War Heat records, he's really kind of abrasive and good. And th there was another band too that had just come around and I know they got a bit more kind of commercial and popular later, but the, the Screaming Blue Messiahs. Oh, yeah. Bill, Bill mm -hmm. Carter, like his guitar player, yes. which is totally from the Wilco Johnson kind of yes. as well. That was that was kind of an, a bit of an influence on the Lemon Drop sound as well. Was mm -hmm. that first Screaming Blue Messiah six track yeah. EP, which came out in the, I think the summer of '84. So it was kind of a mixture of all that, really. Kind yes. of, you know, and with kind of the me melodic kind of we, you know, we it kind of progressed to songwriters a little bit by then. So combining all three, you know, we I don't know it was there was there was no. It, there wasn't really a master plan, but there kind of was an underlining thing that we we kind of sort of wanted to try and do it right. We never thought in a million years we would get a, you know, get in a living in Wolverhampton and being unemployed and with no manager, no record company, no nothing. We never thought in in a million world it would become, you know, uh, I don't want to say career, but you know, anything. <coughs> like that. We just wanted to play some games. Round and round, turn me upside down. Singles are associated with the C eighty six movement. In right. hind in in hindsight, was the C eighty six movement as exciting as it is now depicted? Um, it's funny, really, because it wasn't really a movement at all at first. It was um, the NME just had the idea to put this because they'd done cassette the, the, the uh, compilation cassettes before. There was actually a mm -hmm. C eighty one. Which was actually more. I don't know if you if you look back and I think you go on Discogs or something and have a look. And that was just a bunch of like bands or all artists, bands or already known. And it was a like a bunch of their outtakes and different kind of uh, bits and pieces. I can't even remember who's on the first. I think like Scritti Politti on the first one. I think uh, mm. I think it might even be on the first one later period. And. Um, but uh, so we didn't really know when we were asked to do C86 and the enemy said they were just doing this compilation of new all new bands. You know, with hindsight, we should have given them, you know, something like what was more definitive of what we were. Instead, we just went in the studio and knocked out three songs in a couple of hours and gave them one of those. And, you know, and it's kind of, it's still to this day, that's kind of one of our regrets is that we did that, that we didn't give them you know, like like an angel, which had been our single, which had come out, and is actually is a you know a pretty decent sounding record. Whereas the song we gave him the eighty six is kind of a kind of a demo, really. You know, but <laughs> we didn't think it would follow us around for forty years or whatever it is. I mean, this is a bit unusual because people normally associate the singer of the band to be the main songwriter. You know, what, what was you and Tony? handling the songwriting was that a perfect situation for you did you uh did you sort of uh enjoy taking maybe being out of the spotlight a little bit um or uh i don't know really because i never really saw myself as as a front man i mean i i don't really have a, a great voice i can sing a little i can do we do a lot of the backing vocals in the studio and stuff and i think tony was pretty much the same as well you know so we were both songwriters, whereas uh, Paul's not the singer was not a songwriter. Mm -hmm. He was he had a great voice and he was a friend and you know he was happy to you know go along with what uh, Tony and I's songs. Other uh, the, the other examples that were the Who would be one example of that where Tony wrote a lot of the songs and yeah. and uh, you know that's one example. There's probably a lot more as well, but yeah, yeah, yeah but you know nowadays yeah. it's just. People just see a band yeah, and they just like assume. Seven, yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. I was thinking meant nowadays there's like seven writers on in every song. Or not in <laughs> yeah. Or or you look at a band like EMF, where yeah, it's like yeah. it's like the geekiest looking guy in the oh, band. Ian he Dench. was the main guy. Yeah, yeah Ian yeah. Dench. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah, I was the yeah. Ian Dench of the Mighty Levendorf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I keep trying to know that guy too, because he was in a band before that, what are called, um, what are they called uh, Apple, Apple Mosaic. And they're, they're really good, actually. But he was just the guitarist. Yeah. 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 Now, NXS, NXS is another one, the keyboard player who wasn't there the last guy. Yeah. Main songwriter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a fa oh. fairly well known one that we overlooked there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, are you guys just trying to prove me wrong here or something? Uh, <laughs> yes. Your first few singles in the UK were critically acclaimed. You did really well. However, the US market didn't even get to really hear the band until the Happy Head album in 1986. Were you surprised by the positive reaction in the States? Yeah, we were. It's something we never really thought about. You know, it was just seemed like a whole, you know, other area. We um, we we visited New York when because originally we were on a different label in the UK. We we were on um, we were on a subsidiary of Chrysalis, which was Jeff Travis who ran Rough Trade had a mm -hmm. label through Chrysalis called um, called Blue Guitar and uh, and but we, we before we we were actually still unemployed at the time. Chrisley flew us to New York to meet the American company. And uh, I mean, it was just like it was all about Huey Lewis and Pat Benatar. And they hadn't got a like <laughs> a, these four guys from England with short hair. Well, in, in 1985, in you know, we're just like, we just looked like we we're from Mars or something. <laughs> and but luckily, and then, but Seymour was always yeah. interested, Seymour Stein and mm -hmm. Sire was always interested in us. And we'd met with Warner Brothers in the UK, and they were the same as what Chrysalis were in the US. They were like, it was clueless. It was all about top 40 stuff, and they didn't really... They, it, we didn't just connect with them. So we were able to sign to two different labels. We signed to Sire for North America and uh, to with Chrysalis for UK, Europe, and uh, actually the rest of the world. You know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, uh, you know, the C86 movement is... You know, this was like a much tougher album than C86. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make comparisons, but back then, back in 1986 when this came out, the first thing I thought of, it really reminded me of the first Echo and the Bunny Moon record. Just that okay. uh, that great, aggressive, uh, uh, you know, it it's not adhering to a pop or alternative formula. It's like everything, but it's got great tunes. But also, I would say that that was further... That idea of Echo and the Bunny was was further helped by watching the Sire label spin because Echo were on Sire Records over here. So yeah, they were, yeah. Um, another, exactly. yeah. So, Steve, I think David's tired of the Echo and the Bunnyman comparisons at this point. Uh, well, well, I stopped. I stopped. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I stopped, Ronald. <laughs> you know, Ronnie, thank you for that. But uh, I mean, you know, it's like yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, I get it because I mean, it's like you know, I mean, we like the Bunnyman, but. It was, we were getting a little tired of it because it was a bit of a lazy comparison because of all the other stuff that we, yeah. I mean, not stolen or ripped off, but were influenced by, there was a lot more to it than that. It's like, not just we were trying to rewrite the bloody bunny men songbook or, or anything, you know, but, but there is, I do get the comparison to our first album and, and Crocodiles, the first bunny men album, because Crocodiles are actually a great album. I actually like the, the, the first four bunny men albums. I still think are great. They, they really, they really stand up, you know, and they were quite groundbreaking at the time, especially like Heaven Up Here and, uh, you know. You know, Ronnie was really influenced by the Bunnymen too. In fact, most people used to call uh, the Muffs, the first three albums, we, we called them Kim and the Bunnymen. So. <laughs> 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 you can't stop my heart Next album, 1988's World Without End, was a success in the U.S. Did you realize that there seemed to be a lot more support here for the Money Lemon Drops than for a lot of your contemporaries? Um, I thought it was funny, really, because um, living in the U.K., we didn't really, because, like, uh, MTV picked up on the single from the album, Inside mm -hmm. Out, 
And MTV wasn't that big in, in the UK because you didn't really get cable TV at that point. You got, it was like the early days of like, uh, we actually had a satellite because by that time I, I was with, because my wife Becky's American and which is how, what I mean, blah, blah, blah. That's how I ended up here and all mm-hmm. that. And um, so we wanted to get MTV. So we actually brought, we had like this big satellite dish outside our house. You know, and, uh, but uh, it was not common to it. The MTV did not have the same impact or relevance as what he did in the US. So it's kind of a surprise for us that, that MTV picked up on that video because they they hated everything that we'd done previously to that from the previous album and all that. So I think that had an impact. And, you know, the, the other great thing about the, the US is, is like college radio and alternative radio was such a, you know, they were big supporters. And again, this is all like new territory to us because in the UK, you, you got Radio One, which kind of goes throughout the whole country, and and if you're on that, you 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 you're a hit. If you're not, you you, you know you you're an underground artist. Mm-hmm. Right? So so that kind of you know that that helped us have a bit of an impact. Was was the help of College Radio and and an even MTV, you know, at that point, right. which was like wow, you know, that's that's great. What also, kind of touring were you doing at this point, David, in the states? Were you opening for other bands or headlining or both or you know, we did that. that the, well, the first part of the world we got into was with Love and Rockets. When Love and Rockets, and they were at their peak, they were like, um, it was that No New Tale to Tell was their mm-hmm. hit. And we did like like Universal Amphitheater, which is like, what's that, bloody 5,000, 6,000 capacity? So, yeah. which was great. I mean, that was a fantastic tour, great time. And it's really weird because like, in the UK, we couldn't have, would never have really been able to tour with, so because they we were quite different, really. Let my slum drop, slum rockets, but but in the US, it's kind of the same kind of people liked both bands, like them, and kind of liked us. So it was actually a good thing for us to do. And um, and other bands we toured with on that album was right after that we toured with the Church, who were one of my favourite bands. I love, I love the Church and. They just had that hit with Under the Milky Way, which was their mm-hmm. uh, their big known song. So it was this crazy time for us where, you know, we were just like playing these like, I mean, not in Normo domes, but for us, I mean, it was. It was like we'd gone from playing in, you know, yeah. 700 capacity clubs to, you know, two, 3,000 capacity venues, for, you know, and bigger, you know. So um, it was brilliant. So we did the, the dates with the church and... Yeah. Then the rest of the rest of that US tour we did with a band called the the, the Rave Ops opened for us. Oh yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So that, so that was fun. And um, then a bit later on, we we toured with a lot of other bands. Like we did a big tour with Ocean Blue, uh, just just as they were breaking before they got uh, more popular. And uh, yeah, we did lo- lots of lots of different bands. It was great. Well, here's here's a little something to think about, David. Love and Love and Rockets just did a very successful reunion tour. I saw that. Hint, <laughs> hint, hint, hint. <laughs> Were you writing differently? I mean, I mean, did you find yourself consciously wanting to uh, explore new avenues with each album, or did the band sound and yours and Tony's songwriting evolve organically? You know, yeah, I think yes, it did. The only difference being that was most of the first album was written before we had a, a record deal. That mm-hmm. was just the band and what we sounded like, and it's just what we wanted to do. I think by the time we come to write the second album, it was right. We're on a major record label now. We should, you know, we we didn't change our sound or anything, but you, you do. It, it's kind of in your consciousness, just that little bit more, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't sit down and have a big meeting saying, right now, whoa, we got to like go com- more commercial or anything. It was like a natural kind of thing, really. But we we did kind of want. We didn't want to make the same record again, but we did want to keep an element of the same kind of energy and you know and that to it you know yeah. certainly with the second album we did it was a little more thought out mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we did spend more time on it the first album was 
I mean, we, we did it with Stephen Street and we literally knocked it out. We were booked in a studio for like two weeks and I think we finished it in about 10 days or something and we had loads of spare time. So we knocked out loads of B-sides and I think it was mixed in three or four days. Whereas the second album, World Without End, I think there was a lot more time spent on that. We kind of went through the individual instruments in parts and blah, blah, blah. But I still think, you know, it's a, it's a good album in a different way. They're, they're different right. records, really. 1989's Laughter was another album embraced by U.S. audience. And, you know, the band didn't have a top 40 single or anything, but there was still a growing buzz here. Did it seem that the audiences in the U.K. had sort of moved on to other things while the American fans were far more dedicated? Um, yeah, a lot. To, uh, England, the U.K., England, sorry. Uh, I mean, the whole, you know, Great Britain. Things moved so quickly there because... You know, you get, I mean, you, you, at the time you got three music papers every week. You get the NME, Sounds and Melody Maker. So it's like things evolve quick, a lot quicker there than they do in the US. And I think because like, you know, we, we, we had kind of gone from being, we were like Flavor of the Month for like about, I don't know, two or three months in 1976, 1986 or whenever it was. But um, like by then it was like a lot of uh, dance culture had become, yeah, you know, like bands like Stone Roses, Happy Mondays, had started becoming. It were great bands, and it was great. And I mean, we we all really loved that that stuff as well. But we were kind of seen a bit of like with the younger people as being part of the old guard. By then, whereas in the US, we were still like a, a seen more as a an up and coming band. Yeah, the UK moves a lot quicker, so things had changed a little. You know, I mean, that okay. Yeah. That album did okay in the in the U, in the UK. We did a you know the we we we're still playing pretty decent sized venues and all that. And the single "Into the Heart of Love" did actually chart. It got into the the main top top seventy five. Wow! You know? yeah. And actually, the album in the US actually got in the Billboard two, which is the only one of our albums that got in the Billboard two hundred. Funnily. It's Any fans out there that maybe missed it, there is a box set that exactly. contains the, those first three albums through Cherry Red, plus a couple of discs of early singles, uh, BBC sessions, demos, all this kind of stuff, which is really, really worthwhile. So if you want to check out that period of the Lemon Drops career, definitely uh, pick out or pick up this box that is now available on Cherry Red. Mighty Lemon Drops, Inside oh, Out, what? 1985 to 1990. I got to throw in those little commercials there, David. Plug, plug. Thank you. <laughs> These are not included in the box set, but two more great albums. I think they were only released in the U.S., and that would be a Sound, uh, you Goodbye go. to Your that. Standards. Yeah. And this is A Wounded Bird with bonus tracks. Oh, okay. ooh, ooh. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I spend my money wisely, David. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, Ricochet. Now... <laughs> Sound did actually come out in the UK. Okay. And uh, we, that was actually our last uh, UK tour uh, was for the Sound album. And mm -hmm. uh, Ricochet was, because we were kind of by that point, we were thinking of, you know, we were, we'd we we'd had a good run. You know, when you're younger, like we've been together like six years, seven years, and that's, that's kind of a long time when you're in your 20s, you know. Yeah. And we were kind of thinking, you know, we, we weren't sure where we were going to go after that. And then Sire in the US said, you know, we'd like to do another album if you, you're up for it, which was Ricochet. And uh, we were kind of, we were not taken aback by it, but, uh, and we were given kind of pretty much free reign to do as we what we wanted to do on that one. And uh, it was uh, it was a lot more fun. I'm not really that happy with the sound album, to be honest. Like, it's my least favorite of all our albums. But uh, but uh, because I think we got something back more like what we was the original idea. You know, we did we'd we'd had a different bass player for the, those albums yeah. after Tony left, Marcus joined, and uh, that changed a little of the, the the sound and the dynamic a little bit. 
you know, he was a great guy and we got on really well and he's a great bass player as well and everything, but but it was different, you know, and I, I was the main songwriter on my own as well. back on the, the fact that you split do you have regret or do you think it was just kind of the right time i think it was the right time because um after when we put that album out we were kind of thinking are we going to tour then we, we got offered this tour with uh, in the u.s with material issue and too much joy mm-hmm. and uh, if you know those bands yeah and, uh, very much yeah yeah and uh we just thought and we literally we were like you know this is it. Let's just go out. Let's have one last tour, and then we we knew we were going to break up at the end of it. And it was it was effing. It was brilliant because we we knew this was going to be the last time that we were ever going to do this as a band. And we just had loads of fun, had a great time. And at the end of it, we all you know everybody had kind of you know I, I, I actually Keith our drummer was he got married and was uh, he was living over here. He was living in San Francisco. I'd moved to London. Uh, uh, Mark as the bass player was also living in London. Paul was still in Wolverhampton. So we were all kind of, you know, we'd, we kind of were starting to drift apart. So everything just seemed like, just seemed like the right time. Are you still in contact with any of those guys? Yeah, pretty everyone, yeah. For, and uh, we still see, I see, I see Tony and I see Keith quite often. And the only one, I've, I can, I've actually not seen Paul in, we did, we did one reunion gig in 2000, which, it, it, it's funny, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but it was actually tw- 23 yeah. years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so we did that, and um, we, uh, that was, you know, I, I, to be honest, I've not seen him since in person. You that know, was just a one off his... gig? That was just a one off gig, David? You did? It was a one off that we did, yeah. And uh, we just, it was just fun. We just thought we'd do it. I, I don't know. We just, it felt like doing it and after that we just you know uh said bye and maybe we'd do another but we get it's funny because we're getting offered a lot of stuff now especially with a lot of these you know those 80s with uh rival kind yeah. of things and all mm-hmm. that yeah. but um i don't know i mean it's it's you know paul doesn't seem to be into doing it i know people's lives change and move on you know what prompted uh the relocation to the u.s you had met uh your Wife, Who's your wife, right? Yeah, well, I met her in 87. We've been together a long time. And uh, she, she was living in Wolverhampton with me. Then we moved to London in 1990. And uh, we lived there together. And after the lemon drops, I had a day job. I worked at, I don't know if you know, Record and Tape Exchange in London, the famous, or Music and Video Exchange, as it's now called. So mm-hmm. There's a game there in Notting Hill Gate. There's one in Camden. There's one in, they're, they're all over. Uh, I was working there. I worked there from 92 till, nine, actually, 93, I beg your pardon, because Lemon Drop's still going. Uh, even when I was doing Blue Aeroplanes and Starfish, I was mm-hmm. working at Record and Tape, ex- uh, record, well, <sighs> Music and Video Exchange. Right. So I did that for a couple of years, and uh, my wife had an okay job, and we loved living in London, but, you know, we never had any any money. We would basically get by, we'd pay, we you know, pay our bills, get by, pay our mortgage, blah, blah, blah. And we just kind of got tired of, and then one day we just went and we we're like, hey, what about trying, you know, let's give a give LA a try again, you know. And uh, so we we, put, we did decide to do that at the beginning of '95 and got a play. We bought, uh, we were looking, she's from the west side, west uh, west LA originally, and uh, we looked around there, couldn't afford it, of course. <laughs> yeah. And I had the idea of Burbank because. When 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 Lemon Drop stays, we had a lot of friends who we became friends with who lived in Burbank who worked at Sire at Warner's and stuff. And we've been here for twenty eight years now. I, I love Burbank; it's a great place to live. We've got lots of great friends, and I was able to get we have a two car garage out back, which I, I I mean the studio thing was, you know, I thought I'd just do it for myself to keep me out of trouble for a couple of years in. Like 96, 97, I started building it, started buying 
I would buy a recycler first thing on a Thursday morning. I'd buy all 10. I don't even remember a recycler, the second yeah. the you. And I would just buy, like, look for studio equipment. And, like, when studios were going out of business, I'd buy all their crappy old analog gear, which they didn't want at the time because they were all going yeah. digital. And yeah. uh, so, and that's how I built. I, I had no money, very little money, no job. And uh, I would I would sell bits and pieces. I find something that I knew was worth a lot of money. I'd, and that's how I built my studio. It was literally from the ground up, and recorded a friend's band, and turned out okay. They told somebody else, and that's what I've been doing now for twenty five years. with and produce other artists who else have you worked with over the last 25 years oh god um let me think the i've had a few bands a lot of the band the artists i should say well, they're not all bands um it's kind of word of mouth i've never like advertised i've never i'm not a commercial studio mm -hmm. it's basically a two car garage converted but one of the things i wanted to be able to do was i'm not a drummer but i've always been kind of like obsessed with drum sounds and when when I was a kid and in younger bands, it's like, how come some studios can't get a good drum sound? And I've always kind of been a bit obsessed with with, with that and all that. So one thing I can get here is a, a, I have a good room to get a nice kind of drum sound and all that. So I do, you know, it, I mean, most of the stuff I do is either like, I, I hate to categorize it in one particular genre, but it, it's either indie rock, pop, punk, you know, mm -hmm. kind of most of the stuff I do is is, is that kind of stuff. But you know, some of the more the, the bands that I've had a, a few bands like got the one band that had, had that got signed uh, internationally. One band was called the Little Ones, who were signed to mm -hmm. Heavenly yeah. in the UK. And uh, the Soft Pack is another band that I worked with who got signed. They originally called the Muslims, then they changed the name to. Soft Pack. <laughs> they, they also got signed to Heavenly yeah. and all that. Um, Great also, label. Uh, oh God, the, the Henry Clay people kind of did all right. The, the Blood Arm also uh, had mm -hmm. a lot of. Uh, did quite well in the UK. They actually, they actually live in Germany now. They're still there. Um, I think uh, the Henry Clay people, uh, Aberdeen, uh, the movies, uh, who are a Los Angeles band, who kind of did okay. Um, yeah, just lots of uh, lots of different ones. Really, Happy yeah. Hollows, another one who actually Sarah, the singer, uh, played with uh, Silver some pickups as well. It's kind of her. Her uh -huh. other band is uh, Happy Hollows. Oh, okay. So, you know, kind of local kind of bands, but some 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 great ones. I've been lucky, nice, and, and I get on really well with and become friends with most of the people that I kind of work with, which is nice as well. Nice. Yeah, Steve. Steve, that's yeah. not the movies from the seventies, by the way. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you see, no, it's funny he... because I would I would mention that to the band, and they'd like never heard of them. Yeah, no, mo only us, me and Steve have. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, I know <laughs> the movie. Remember, they're okay. on. Um, what label were they on? There was it G not GTO Records. Um, I like yeah, I think so. Yeah, well, now the records. Yeah, you it was see, one of like, those weird labels. Yeah, Areola or something. You know, one of those weird. I mean, ones, yeah, so. I think it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Ronnie, yeah. as you can see behind <laughs> Ronnie, he collects music paraphernalia, rock paraphernalia, uh, promotional items. He has. Really? See, you're not going to know this, but I get excited when he shows me a pencil for Sue Sad and the Next. <laughs> I want to know who that is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, like you, I'm equally as sad, by the way. I mean, there it is. Oh, there! there I, have, I have it handy. Yeah. I know. Fantastic. That is brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, man. I wish I'd have, I would have pulled some stuff out had I known. I've got. No, I've got that, I was going to ask, David. Any yeah. Mighty Lemon Drops promo items? Because I don't oh, have any. Of stuff. There, there's wow. some awful things, but we'll do for sure. <laughs> did they do candy? Did they do actual promo? They did. It seems like a, yeah. One of the, the goofiest, wackiest thing they did was they made a Mighty Lemon Drop, which was this big, it was like, a, is it black <laughs> lemon drop? But it's like yeah. this big, and it's like a big <laughs> lemon drop in the same size packet. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I could have put, I've got one somewhere. I would, ah. 
I can't. I don't know where it is. I would have, if I'd have known in advance, I would have got that. <laughs> um, I'll send you a photo of one. Yes, no. As an artist, you have a project called David Newton and the Mighty Angels, uh, which was released in 2020. Uh, the album is called A Gateway to a Lifetime of Disappointments, uh, which I think is one of the catchiest and most consistent albums of your career. What can you tell us about this release? Well, first of all, thank you. That's that's amazing. Um, I don't know. It was um, I, I started putting that because uh, I'd always I've yeah, been a songwriter and, and worked with a lot of you know, bands, Lemon Drops, obviously, and other things since then. But uh, I'd never really done anything on my own, even though I'd had the studio. And uh, I, um, in it was 2010, 2011, I started, I had a bunch of songs that I'd not done anything with. And I actually put out an EP then, which is actually, five of the songs are actually on the full length album. And uh, that was called the Paint the Town EP. Mm -hmm. Paint the Town mm -hmm. is one of the songs. That was actually the opening track on that EP. And, um, you know, I, I didn't really push it too hard, but it did get a good kind of response. And then, you know, I know, not saying, I'm not going to say it's a cliche, but during pandemic, during lockdown, I was, you know, looking, you know, realized I had a handful of more unfinished songs. So yeah, I kind of started putting them together and, uh, you know, I had some friends who'd been involved who sent me some things that they'd recorded and put them together. So that I that's when that came around was uh I think I put it out in July of twenty twenty. And uh it was, you know, just uh, you know, just uh, just something I'd always really wanted to do, really. This is a fantastic uh, uh, the songs of uh, like the title comes from sort of from the song My First Band. My first band, it does, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now what band is that referring to? Is that active restraints? That's the lowest class. Okay, the lowest class. That's yes. like, yeah, we were, we were it was literally we were at school and we had like, you know, it was a uh, our punk band and like it was, you know, we used to practice at the the youth club and uh we we, we played a gig in front of uh uh you know people at the youth club, our teachers and stuff and yeah, that was, and it, it's you know, it's quite, it's it's a, a literal song. The lyrics kind of just basically say what what occurred, you know, and uh, yeah, and then my you know, my joke was like, with it being, it was a, a gateway to a lifetime of of disappointment, which it's kind of self <laughs> because I mean I can't really complain because I mean I've had some good times out of you know the the I hate to say the old music bloody industry or whatever, but. Uh, but um, no, but it was never like because it's. I think it's a Wolverhampton thing too, where we're from. It's like you're not really. You always kind of look on the kind of the the, the grim side rather than the upside, and like you know. If you were going to take a mixtape, I'm not talking about a playlist on Spotify. If you were going to make a mixtape yep. or a mix CDR, what three, four David Newton? Pen songs would you choose, wow. and what and what other artists would you put on that mixtape? I'd put all other artists. I don't think I'd put any of my own. <laughs> <in it. laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, like, but one of my favorite bands ever was uh, a a punk band called The Boys. Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah, absolutely that's... fantastic, fabulous. Duncan Reed's new album is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he stuff's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah. Uh, Alternative Chartbusters by the Boys is my favorite album of all time. Yeah, this is their second album, and Brickfield Nights. Yes, track from that album mm -hmm. is, is one of my favorite singles of all time. That it, that would be on it, and uh, that's it. I can't really think of anything. <laughs> Real fast, uh, before Ron, you know, I've been friends with Ronnie for years, so, but he didn't. Yep. He wasn't a, a co-host originally on Beach Blinking for Bingo. It was just me, okay. right? Until I got smart and brought Ronnie in. <laughs> the very first episode was Duncan Reed. Oh, wow. Bloody hell. How long yeah. ago was that? Uh, oh. That was probably two and a half years ago or so. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? It's Well, that 
that's it. Ronnie and I would like to thank our special guest, David Newton, for stopping by and chatting about the mighty lemon drops, the mighty angels, and so much more. If you'd like to order a copy of David Newton's excellent album, A Gateway to a Lifetime of Disappointments, I'll have a link in the description of this video. I'll also include a link to order the mighty lemon drops box set as well. We'd like to thank all of you for hanging out and watching us here and we'll see you next time on beach blanket fort bingo goodbye everybody Can I just say something? Uh -huh. This is kind of off record a bit now. I don't know if you want to, like, not. Uh -huh. to this, but you know, Ronnie, you know, I kind of met you a long time ago. And I don't know if you, you probably will not remember this, but but um, it was when you were recording the first Muffs uh, major label album. Uh, my wife's cousin is Kim Annenberg, who is married to Rob Cavallo. And I came oh, down. Oh, wow. We were, I was, we were still living in the UK at the time, and and I, I didn't really know Rob that well, even though he worked at Warner Brothers, and we were on Warner Brothers. But he was in, I don't, he was in a different department to what we were in in the in the eighties, kind of uh, early nineties at least. Anyway, but I would go and say hi when I was there. And one day I went in, and he said, "Oh yeah, I just signed this band, The Muffs," and I was like, "What? The Muffs? Really?" I was kind of not surprised, but kind of was. And uh, so I was visiting here with my wife and we went out to dinner with Rob and Kim. And afterwards, they took us to the studio where you were recording your first album uh, for, for Warners. Uh, you probably have no recollection of that whatsoever. Yeah. What studio was that? No, no. And David, you certainly didn't. Uh, well, we there were a few. Uh, Devonshire, um, you, uh, Sound City, um, NRG. Um, NRG, it was NRG. We bounced around a lot. Like, okay. Yeah, Rob, Rob, Rob definitely uh, spent. You know, we spent our entire budget on that record. Yeah, and, oh, yeah. and, and <laughs> on all of our all of our major label records. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Two hundred grand and stuff. No, oh, David, you God. certainly didn't say I'm David. I was in the Mighty Lemon Drops. I had no idea. But this yeah. is incredible. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do remember Thank meeting you. you guys. We just we wow. We saw, literally, we gone out. We, so I think the studio must have been somewhere near Hollywood because we went out to dinner somewhere in Hollywood and just we just Yeah, it was like, probably when we were in the overdub period. So we we're in one of those random okay. Oh, that's a great story.